Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here. Excited to get into God's word with you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we just ask this morning that, um, again, we just, we come to you knowing that um, you are the one that actually changes our hearts. And God, even as unfortunately this online thing has become probably kind of routine, and we do look forward to being together again soon, but God, right now we ask that this morning wouldn't be just routine, Um, that when we come to your word, we know that your Holy Spirit empowers it and helps us to actually change from the inside out, and we ask for that this morning. Um, We just know that you have abundant life for us um, that is way better than we could dream up, and so we um, we want more of that. We want more of you this morning. And we ask that you would um, meet us in a unique way this morning, that we would see, uh, even though this is a familiar passage of scripture, that we would see it in a new way, in a fresh way this morning through your Holy Spirit. We thank you. Thank you so much that you're here. Thank you that you're with us. Um, (laughs) We just love you so much, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, today we're talking about prayer And prayer is this really interesting kind of paradoxical thing because on one hand, prayer comes naturally to humans. Um, And it comes naturally kind of in those random moments where, uh, you know, something alarming or scary happens. You kind of immediately pray. And here's the funny thing about that is that I've talked to people who, are, would say that they're agnostic or even some people who are atheist and you can ask them if they pray and sometimes they'll admit yes. But if you kind of reframe like, what, what are you talking about when you pray? Just like I've asked people who don't believe in God or don't believe that there is a God. <clears throat> I've asked them, hey, it, when something like scary happens or you're in a moment and you need something or you're kind of freaked out about what's going on, do you ever have an internal dialogue and just thoughts in your mind where you're like, someone help. Someone out there help me. And it's interesting because almost everybody, even people who don't believe in God, who don't think they pray, do that. That comes very naturally to us, just in those random moments. And, um, and so it's this, that, that inner dialogue, moment by moment, it comes naturally, but it also feels difficult. And, and because I think when people think about prayer, they think a little bit more along the lines of, you know, bowing next to your bed, folding your hands, those kind of uh, things. And so, you know, when we, if you've ever tried to just like spend some time praying, like set aside some time to pray, it's difficult. Like you kind of are like, okay. And you try to like get settled in and you're sort of like, um, dear God, would you bless the world? and my family, and it can just feel a little awkward, a little forced. And then like, if you've ever tried to do that and focus for an extended period of time, even like five minutes, your brain is all over the place. You're trying to pray and then you're thinking about like, oh shoot, I forgot to do the dishes. And did I, you know, did I leave the window open? And is it raining? And like all this stuff, we just have all these random thoughts that are coming in our head. And so at the prayer at the same time comes naturally and it's also really difficult. And what's funny is that when we talk about prayer, I think most of the time uh, our immediate feeling especially for those of us that, you know, follow Jesus, when somebody says that they're going to talk about prayer, or if somebody asks us like, how's your prayer life? Our immediate feeling is often guilt or shame. And I think it's because we have this thing of it's like, yeah, I, I should do better, you know, or it could be better. And now here's the thing. And I just want to like lay this foundation for us this morning. It's like, we can all grow in prayer. We can all grow in our relationship with God because God is infinite. Like we'll never reach the limits of relationship with him. So we can always grow in relationship with God. But um, this morning, I want us to understand that even though we definitely want to grow in prayer today, the beautiful thing is that the only reason that we can talk to God in the first place, the only reason that prayer is a real thing is because he created us to want to talk to him because he wants us to have conversation with him. 
The only reason we can pray is because God is actually listening to us and because God wants to speak to us. And so this morning, I just want to ask if you, do you want to be really good at prayer? Then accept Jesus's gift of salvation. If you want to be an amazing prayer, accept Jesus's gift of salvation because it's only through Jesus that we actually have this relationship with God where our prayers are completely unhindered before him. And we actually get to experience this kind of relationship with God where we don't have to think about, am I doing this well enough? Jesus already did it well enough on our behalf. So you want to be an amazing prayer, have a relationship with Jesus. Um, And so that's kind of the jumping off point. And now the reality is God hears everybody's prayers. Here's the prayers of people who are not saved yet. Um, He's God. He can do that anytime. But I want us to just this morning, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We're going to get into a very familiar passage where Jesus teaches the Lord's prayer. And this morning, I want us to step into this letting go of that shame of like, oh, I should do better. And instead, rather than hearing this as, you know, in receiving this in a shameful way, I want you to see Jesus's hand extended out to you saying, come see what I have for you. Come see how much more beautiful this relationship that I long to have with you is than you've even imagined. So just feel that invitation from Jesus this morning. All right. And here's why I think it's important for us to talk about prayer this morning is it's because your prayer life shows the focus of your heart. I think when you pray, you see most clearly the things that are going on in your heart. See, we naturally pray for things that we want or need. It comes out with us, you know, without us even thinking about it, just, that just comes out. And when you listen to yourself pray or, or just pay attention to the kind of things that you pray about, you see kind of where your priorities are or the things that are consuming your thoughts. And it also kind of shows you the way that you relate to God. So there's a lot of things about our hearts that we see when we pray. And so today, as we look at the Lord's prayer, this is both, Joseph, this is both Jesus showing us where his heart was at personally but it's also him showing us how to aim or how to refocus our hearts and our minds to be more relationally engaged with God in prayer. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So again, we're in Matthew chapter six, just like last week, we're actually just kind of jumping backwards in the chapter. So this uh, is, we're going to start in verses five and six. So Jesus says this, and when you pray, Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, first of all, when Jesus is saying this, he's not condemning all public prayer of any kind, right? Jesus himself prayed publicly, like with his disciples or even in front of crowds and things like that. What he's calling out specifically and the word he uses is hypocrites or hypocritical prayer. And he's talking about where your heart is at, right? A hypocrite is somebody who says one thing, but their motivation is different than what they're saying, right? And so what and, and that's something that just bugs Jesus, right? The people he got most upset at were hypocritical people like the Pharisees, right? And often the Pharisees, like we say, it's because they were religious, but actually it's more because they were like falsely religious. Their religion didn't have to do so much with, um, with connecting to God or connecting other people to God. Their religious practice had a lot more to do with them just wanting to look good and exercise power over people. And man, did that bug Jesus. So you want to get on Jesus's nerves, be hypocritical. All right. Um, But what he's calling out is just where your heart is at when you pray. So a person using prayer to make themselves look more spiritual, ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to use God to you for your own agenda. And the reality that Jesus is pointing out is that God will not be used for your agenda. No matter what, um, no, no matter how spiritual or how amazing your prayers sound, if your heart is in the place of like, I, you know, I just want to look good for other people. Jesus is kind of like, that's what you get. And I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever felt used by someone, 
Uh, but nobody likes to feel used, right? Maybe you had a friend who you know they, they came over because they, you, they, you just had that one toy that they liked to play with. Or like, just imagine this. Let's say that you're a famous person, okay? And let's say that you had a friend or, or at least an acquaintance who would come over and they would hang out. But every time they came over and hang out to like have a conversation with you, they always had to live stream it to Instagram. And most, they did most of the talking and then when they would ask a question, it was more like they were making a statement and they were using really big words to sound smart and impressive to the people who were apparently watching. How would you feel? Probably not very close or connected relationally to that person. Probably feel used. Now think about God hearing this prayer full of big, impressive, loud words and seeing what is actually going on in the person's heart as they just want to look impressive to the people around them. And you kind of can hear God saying through Jesus here, he's like, oh, that was for all of those people? All right, those people can answer your prayer then. You've received your reward in full. And so Jesus cannot be just a badge that we wear to look good or look spiritual to others. He's the eternal creator. He is the purpose and the focal point of creation. Our lives, like we exist to bring him glory. The reason that you and I have breath is for Jesus. And he sees through our attempts to make him fit into our agendas for our lives. And he just won't go there. And so what, that's what Jesus is talking about. He's like, don't try to make prayer about forcing your agenda on God, because honestly, it just doesn't work. You can't trick God into doing your agenda by praying really well. And on the other side of the same coin, I would just encourage you, I think a, a ton of people um, are like, okay, good, I'm good at this one because I never pray out loud. And I would just encourage you, you don't have to be embarrassed to pray out loud because often that comes from a similar thing. Not that you want to pray out loud to look impressive, but you don't want to pray out loud because you think you'll look stupid. And I would just encourage you, like, if you just tell Jesus what's on your mind, what's on your heart, if you get an opportunity to pray with people around you, with your family, you know, what, whatever, in a small group, just if you're telling Jesus what's truly on your mind, what's truly in your heart, and you're just talking to him, it doesn't have to sound impressive. It doesn't have to be full of big theological words. If you just tell him what's going on in your heart, you are doing amazing and he loves it. And you don't have to worry about what anybody else around you is thinking. Just tell him what's on your heart and he loves it, okay? And let me just tell you, if you're the kind of person who likes to judge other people for the way that they pray, I would just say, if I had somebody who made fun of my little girl who's two years old, who's learning how to talk, if they made fun of her for trying to communicate with me, if somebody laughed in her face or even made a little comment about her not being able to talk very good, you know what I would do to them? I can't say it in church. So just let, I'm just letting you know, there is no room for judgment like that in the family of God. And Jesus absolutely loves genuine childlike prayers. So just let, let your guard down a little bit is what I'm trying to say in prayer. Let's keep going. Verses seven and eight. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans or like pastors, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, I'm just kidding. He didn't say pastors in there. But do pastors do like to pray long? And I'm one of those pastors. But what Jesus is specifically talking about is not necessarily about like long prayers. Because sometimes, honestly, like that's just where your heart's at. You got a lot to say. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are on your heart or a lot of things that Jesus is even putting on your heart to pray about, pray those things out. What he's talking about is like basically in every religion, there are these repetitive prayers that you pray over and over. There are these rote things and there's nothing wrong necessarily with rote prayers, but it's just the repetition where it almost becomes mindless. And it's this mindset that it, it's like, if I just like fill in the blank you know, do this enough or say this enough or whatever, then I have a better chance of my prayer being heard. It's like a way of showing my devotion by just repeating this stuff over and over and over again. And what Jesus is encouraging us in prayer is prayer is to be relational, not superstitious. Okay. 
Prayer is about relationship with God, not about superstitiously trying to like work the angles to get our prayers to be good. See, and even if you don't do the repetition thing, kind of the mindless repetition, it's possible that superstitious kind of practice has made its way in your prayer life, right? And we all have little superstitions like don't walk under the ladder or, you know, like I wear these socks when the Packers play because then Aaron Rodgers does better when, you know, or whatever. So you may not be superstitious, right? Right? But you may be just a little stitious in your relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've wanted to pray, but then you feel like before you pray, you kind of need to give yourself a spiritual report card. Like, did I read my Bible enough? How much, how much have I been sinning? Or how much of that one specific sin that I really hyper-focus on have I done recently? Oh, a lot. Okay, I better get my grades up before I really like lean in and talk to Jesus today. And let me just tell you, that's complete superstition. That has no basis in scripture. Our prayer doesn't rise and fall based on, on simply how well we're doing and sort of like our whatever weird report card that we come up with. Now, are there things God cares about and things that can hinder our prayers? Absolutely. But let's let God tell us what those are and let's not define those for ourselves. Okay. See, because prayer, again, it's not about superstitious practice. It's about relationship with God. It's not a transaction. God is not a vending machine. He's our heavenly father. He already knows what we need before we even ask him. And he wants to connect with you. He wants you to know him better. He wants you to experience his love. He wants to give you direction for your day, for a moment by moment kind of walk with him every moment of your day. This was all the stuff that Jesus wants us to know as a setup before he even gave the Lord's prayer. Okay, so all of that stuff is just the setup to hear the way that Jesus gives us or this example that Jesus gives us on how to pray. So let's keep going. Verse nine. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So this is where we start, okay? We start by addressing God as father, but a father who's in heaven and a father who is holy, all right? So that's kind of the first thing that Jesus shows us is to pray with God's fatherness and his holiness, both in focus, okay? And these two things on the surface level can seem a little hard to reconcile and they sort of are, but it's the beauty of the gospel actually that both of these things can be the beginning of our prayer or the stepping off point of relationship with God. And what I mean by that is God is both a heavenly father who loves us and cares about us like crazy, but also is completely holy, completely set apart and completely separate from sin. And here's the amazing thing about the gospel is that God both um, kept 100% of his holiness, like he didn't lower his holiness to connect with us. And he also didn't cheapen the love, the father child kind of relationship that he wants to have with us, but he brought both of those in full force through Jesus, that he took the penalty for our sin that would have held us out of his presence, that would have kept us out of that holy place, but also he brings the fullness of his love through that sacrifice so that we can be restored and adopted into relationship with a holy God as our father. It's mind-blowing, that, but that's where Jesus tells us to start. See, depending on our background, like, you know, whether you grew up in church or not, just the experiences that we've had in life, we will often, and, and especially based on where we've gone to church and the kind of teaching that we've received and things like that, we'll often emphasize one of these things over the other, but we need to see them both at the same time. Because God wants to relate to us as our father like that's the kind of relationship that he wants to have. We are his children, he is our father, but he doesn't lessen his holiness, right? Instead, he sends Jesus so that we can connect with a holy God as our father. So how do we keep these things in alignment when we pray? This is just kind of simply how I would say to keep those, both of those things in focus. Both know that it's not about you when you pray. God is a holy God and again, like everything is about him and for him, okay? So that's how we keep his holiness in focus. And also with a sense of awe, just knowing that like, I have no business apart from Jesus ever being able to talk to God in this way. 
So that's how we keep his holiness in focus and at the same time understanding, but as my heavenly father, because of what Jesus has done on my behalf, I get to have this kind of relationship with God where he actually loves me he actually cares about me. He cares about my needs. Like I'm, you know, I'm concerned about something that might seem trivial on the grand scheme of like all of the universe and all of human history, but God actually cares about that. Like you might be worried about a test coming up or you might be worried about this conversation that you have to have with a friend or with an enemy or whatever. And God cares about those things. It's not too small for him because he's your father and he loves you. So both we come with a sense of awe and respect and the fact that he gets to call the shots and also that he loves us and he cares for us. Let's keep going to verse 10. The next thing that Jesus says is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when we keep God's holiness and his fatherness in focus, we recognize that life is not about me, And if life's not about me, my prayer shouldn't probably just be all about me. And so this is a great place to start. So you've kind of addressed God. You've talked about who God is. And then you start by just saying, God, would you do what you want to do? Would you bring your rule and your reign here on earth and implicitly in my life, just as it's done in heaven? God's will is done perfectly in heaven. Nobody questions it or nothing happens. Here we kind of live in this middle ground where we still have a certain amount of, you know, free choice. And that's great. That's part of God's plan. It's part of the way that we form a love relationship with God is by choosing that, right? But what we're asking is, God, I am choosing to be um, underneath your kingdom and your rule and your reign. See, I think... um, that is something that we can miss. We want God's kingdom to come on earth, right? We want all this bad stuff to hap- stop happening around us, but sometimes we miss the reality of the things that God wants to do in our hearts. So I would just encourage you to pray with a heart of surrender. We all have a picture of what we want our future to look like. We all have a picture of what we want our lives to look like. But when we say your kingdom come, your will be done, we're saying, God, you call the shots in the world in, you know, in my nation, in my state, in my city, in my, you know, in my church, in my life, God, you call the shots. And it's another way of saying, God, I want what you want, or at least I want to want what you want. Maybe I still want certain things and I want to call the shots, but God, I want to want what you want. And it's, it's a kind of a way of saying, God, I know what you have in mind is so much better, so much more beautiful than anything that I could ever ask or imagine. Would you do that? I don't even know, like we, we have tons of crazy stuff going on in our world. And that's been the case for all of human history. And when we're at a loss for words, we don't know what the answer is or how things are gonna get better or what we should do next. I think a great place to start is just saying, Jesus, would your kingdom come and would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And I think as we pray that, he begins to show us what that is and what our part is. And he starts it here, all right? The next thing that Jesus prays in verse 11 is he says, give us today our daily bread. Now, again, as our heavenly father, God really actually cares about our needs. Like he really cares. And I think often people um, almost feel bad about praying about things that seem like too small. But let me just tell you, infinite God never runs out of ability to listen or ability to care. We do, right? Like once you've heard somebody complain about stuff for like, you know, 20 minutes, you're like, all right, I've heard enough. I'm going to move on. God never runs out of patience. He has enough patience for you, for your mess. I mean, like my kids are sometimes annoying but I love them. And does that, just because I get annoyed sometimes, does that ever mean that I want them to stop talking to me? I want them to stop telling me when they need something? Absolutely not. And I'm a messed up earthly father. Our heavenly father knows what we need. He cares. And our daily bread is ultimately just what we need for today. It's like, God, you know what I need for today. And so even if I can't foresee all of the 
potential stuff that could come up or all the potential needs I'll have. God, would you just give me everything I need today? Yes, that means actual like physical provision, actual food, you know, money, whatever, uh, you know, whatever stuff. You can fill in the blanks. But it also means like, God, would you give me strength? Would you give me patience? You know, would you help me to be a patient father with my kids? Like that kind of stuff. That is all a part of this daily provision that we need from God. And here's the thing is like our primary call in life is not just to exist with our needs being met. Our primary call is actually to be a participant in God's kingdom. And so when we have that in frame or we have that like we have that understanding that my life isn't about just having my needs met and being comfortable. My life is actually about participating in God's kingdom. Then we can pray this short about our needs. God, would you just give me everything I need today? And then step forward in faith. See, that's what I think Jesus, at least one of the things that Jesus is inviting us into is by such, I mean, all of this stuff is short. The Lord's prayer is so short and I'm talking for like, you know, 30 minutes on it today, which is kind of dumb, but the Lord's prayer is so short. And especially this thing, just give us today our daily bread. It's like enough said. See, we can pray with confidence in God's provision. We can pray with confidence in God's provision. See, sometimes our needs are so heavy on our minds and we need to just keep bringing them up to God and putting them in his hands. And I would just say, that's actually super good. Like keep doing that. When stuff is clouding your your vision and you're just like, I just need, God, this stuff is like weighing heavy on my heart. It's taking up space in my mind. I wanna think about you, but I'm thinking about these needs. Just keep laying them at his feet. That is so good. That's such a good practice. But at the same time, when we pray, we can just say, God, would you give me everything I need today? And leave it at that and be confident that he will. Because again, that's not the main focus of our life. The main focus is, God, I wanna be a part of what you're doing. I wanna be a part of your will being done, your kingdom coming on this earth. And so all that other stuff, right? And this is what we looked at last week where Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added. It's that kind of attitude saying, saying, Jesus, I wanna be a part of what you're doing. So can you just all the other stuff that would take my focus away from that, all the other needs, I'm just gonna trust you to take care of that stuff. Yes, I'm gonna be wise. Yes, I'm gonna be diligent, but I'm gonna trust you with all the stuff that I can't control as it relates to um, my needs being met. And I'm gonna walk boldly into what you're calling me to do. And so I would just encourage you that when Jesus says, give us today our daily bread, your prayers for your needs can be that simple. Now, again, nothing wrong with telling God everything, just spilling out your heart. He also loves that, okay? But there is a place of faith just saying, you know what, God, you got me. I know that simply saying, give me what I need today is enough because you already know what I need and you love me, okay? Let's finish up here, verses 12 and 13. Um, Jesus says, he wraps up his prayer with this, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. See, last, this last part, and again, I mean, people give so many sermons about the Lord's prayer. Okay. I mean, you can go like people break this stuff down. People would give an entire sermon on one verse of this stuff. Like, so this is, this is by no means an extensive treatment of the Lord's prayer. What I'm really inviting us into is just to see, I think a little bit of Jesus's heart in this. And the last thing that I want us to see, because again, there's so much more that could be said about this, but the last thing that I want us to see in this thing is that Jesus shows us that part of our prayer and part of our heartbeat and part of what our heart is aimed at, the priorities of our heart should be to pray for relational harmony with God and with others. I don't know that this often enters our mind. I think we, we again, I, I'll just, I say we, but I should probably just say I, and if you relate to me, you can nod, okay? But I often pray about stuff that only relates to me. When I'm in the middle of a, of a situation, especially a situation of conflict with somebody else, you know who I'm mostly praying for? Me. You know who I don't often think to pray for? The person I'm in conflict with. Why? Because my main way of thinking is often about me. But in Jesus's prayer, I mean, and oh my goodness, throughout the entire Bible, 
God is over and over and over just expressing how much he cares about the way, not only that we relate to him, but also the way that we relate to other people. And honestly, God receives love from us almost uh, like in a primary way. The primary way God receives love from us is by the way that we love the people around us. See, and what Jesus is saying here is as he says, forgive us as we forgive, he's not talking about like a salvation forgiveness, okay? That just comes through the gift of Jesus. He's talking about an intentional intentional move on my part to repent, to move back into God's will and to move back into harmony with him. See, all sin is firstly an offense against God, okay? And his forgiveness is the main restoration that I need. And, you know, I've been forgiven by Jesus. I still make mistakes and I still need to have a daily and even more often than daily, like hourly, minutely opportunities to repent. Like I need that constantly. And so when we're talking about forgive us as we forgive, the reality is, is like, if I'm holding unforgiveness in my life, I am actively sinning against God by holding anger or bitterness and unforgiveness against somebody else. So that's why these two things are intimately linked is because of the way you think, you know, like, it's like, I like that God loves me. I don't always like that God loves other people, but because God loves me and other people, he cares about the way that I'm relating to other people. So as long as we're holding on to unforgiveness for other people, like we are not walking in step with God. We're choosing to do our own thing. We're choosing to build our own kingdom of hurt and So I'm not saying that forgiveness is easy, but it's a necessary process for us on a day-to-day basis. And when we hold things over other people's heads, it causes us to miss out on the joy of our own forgiveness and our own salvation because we begin to see God through the lens of our own anger and our own unforgiveness and our own lack of grace for the people around us. So that is part of why this matters so much to the heart of God. And not only that, but like relational strife is something that truly affects the way that we relate to God and our prayer life. Like if you think about even the example that uh, Peter gives in 1 Peter, uh, he says, husbands relate to your wives in an understanding way for the sake of your prayers. See, there's something about us living not only in harmony with God, but truly if we love God, we love one another. It says that in 1 John. It says that all over the Bible, in fact. Okay, so what I want you to ask yourself this morning is that I know all of this, you know, we've just kind of taken this piece by piece and it's been maybe a lot. But I want to ask yourself, as you think about your own prayer life, where is your heart at? Is there a place where God wants to redirect or refocus your heart? And I would just encourage you that probably will start in your prayer life. What are the things that you've been thinking about most? What are, what have been your highest priorities in your life and how has that expressed itself in your prayer life? You know, for some of us, a lack of prayer is just showing how much we think that we control in our lives. So maybe it's just stepping into, you know what, God, I just want to, I just want to, think about you more moment by moment in my day. I want you to give me direction and I want to have your heart for the people around me. Um, You know, whatever it is, you can have that conversation with Jesus, but I want you to imagine, okay? Because we often think of prayer as like, oh yeah, prayer, like we do that. And that, you know, it's a good thing. We kind of do that as a transition or whatever. And let's not let prayer be that. Let's see that prayer is an essential part of following Jesus. It's an essential part of actually who we were created to be. Like God made us to pray. We can't separate that from part of what it means to be human. So I want you to imagine what would it look like if just we as a church began to just lean in a little bit more and pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Like imagine us being a church that was that sensitive to God's heart. Not that we would always, you know, do everything perfectly, but when we got something wrong or when we hurt somebody or when we said the wrong thing, we would be sensitive to God's heart to come back around and seek forgiveness and seek restoration. 
Imagine the relational harmony we'd experience with one another. Or imagine if we were all, rather than thinking about what's my agenda or what do I want to see happen or what's my, you know, what is my best for this church or what's my best for people's lives or what's my best for God's community or for this community. What if we were asking what God's best was? And we were all asking that same question. Imagine what this community, our church community would see. Imagine what our surrounding community would see when they see us living together in harmony. Imagine what our lives would look like personally when we have confidence that God is the one that changes hearts. It's not up to me. Um, What if those things began to change as we leaned in to our relationship with our heavenly father in prayer? There's a humbling thing that God does in us when we begin to actually step into relationship with him in a deeper way in the place of prayer and just saying, you know what, God, I I just am admitting, like anytime we pray, we're admitting, God, you are in control. We're admitting, God, I don't have all the answers you do. We admit, God, I don't, I don't always know what's best, but I know you do. These are all things that we do kind of automatically when we pray. So I just want, and I want you to imagine even personally, what would it look like for your life if you just settled in to your relationship with your heavenly father? Like you stop being so freaked out about what does God think about me? And am I being impressive enough to other people? And what if you just settled in and to the fact that God loves you and you could just be childlike with him? What would that look like? So I want us to end today just by praying the Lord's prayer together And uh, if it's not too awkward, I I invite you to actually pray this with me out loud um, wherever you're at. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna close this time by praying this. And, and my prayer is that as we go through this, this God, that God would highlight a specific word or phrase and that he would work that into your heart. Um, So let's do this together. Let's pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.